If you have religious conviction that there are completed infinities and you think about it long enough, you might go a little bit crazy. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 103rd episode of Patterson in Pursuit. A couple of months ago, I was asked by my friend Isaac Morehouse to talk about the philosophy of mathematics and why I care so much about it. He's aware I produce a lot of content. I keep harping on some ideas in math, but why is it the case? Most people think that's kind of crazy. So we had a great discussion and I really enjoyed it and got a lot of things off my chest. But the video is behind a paywall. I liked the interview so much, I said, hey, could I have this interview and put it on my YouTube channel and my podcast because I think my audience will like it. And he kindly agreed. He, he titled the video, Why is Steve Patterson Mad at Mathematicians? Which I think is the, uh, the right title for the talk. If you are, like me, disappointed with the quality of ideas that has come out of the academy and the intellectual paradigm in which we live over the last century plus, and if you're wondering where these bad ideas came from, um, I think a lot of the blame uh, should be placed on the shoulders of mathematicians. And I think whenever we get ourselves out of this intellectual malaise that we're currently in, a lot of very deep revision has to be done with regards to the philosophy of mathematics. And it's not just an esoteric thing that only affects you know, pure math and geometry. It's something, as we discuss in this video, that has implications even for things like COVID lockdowns and football. Um, abuses in the philosophy of mathematics are in a bunch of different disciplines, and the stakes are very large. So my anger at mathematicians is because they're dealing with such important concepts that uh, if we get them wrong, the world can be a significantly worse place. So I really hope you enjoy my conversation with Isaac Morehouse. Steve Patterson, sir. Sir. Um, I want to talk about math. Actually, I want to talk about why you're so angry. Why are you so angry, Steve? <laughs> at uh, infinity. Okay, so I'm shaking my fist at God. No, um, so here, here's, here's the story. Unfortunately, Isaac, in the world of ideas, people are very hierarchical. And the world of ideas itself is very hierarchical. People think that, you know, at the peak of the pyramid, you have mathematics, and then you have right below that maybe physics. And if you talk to some physicists, they might say actually physics uh, is on top. There's a little bit of disc debate between those two. But generally, if, uh, if you've got an economist and a mathematician going into the room, and there's some disagreement about the economist's graph from the mathematician, the mathematician's gonna win because he's a mathematician. And in my personal pursuit of truth, uh, I find logic to be very, very, very important, as you know, right? Uh, square one, the foundations of knowledge, logic and existence are inseparable. I think this is a really important point. And in making this argument years ago, I had lots of criticism for people who were, who were appealing to math or physics, ironically, um, saying, no, no, you can have logical contradictions. Like for example, in mathematics, I was in, this is a, this has actually happened. I went and interviewed a professor in person in Columbia University who told me that one example of a logical contradiction is uh, an infinite set in mathematics. And he, he was saying, well, logical contradictions, yeah, they can exist. It's not that big a deal. Look, they're used like in mathematics, an infinite set is a logical contradiction. He, he said that. He also said that um, another example would be the Pope, because the Pope is both married and unmarried at the same time. He's married to the church and unmarried. So this is a professor saying this, right? I said, oh, why am I angry? Um, so then I, and, and in uh, physics, for example, people would say, oh, well, of course there are logical contradictions. You have this thing called superposition. Things could be in two mutually exclusive states at the same time. That's called superposition, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I started researching physics, a little bit of physics and some mathematics to figure out where the hell are these ideas coming from. And to my shock and horror, I consider our current uh, mathematical paradigms since the late 1800s to be built on foundations of sand. There are absolutely terrible ideas that are nested in the foundations of math, uh, foundations of higher math, not necessarily talking about arithmetic here, that are wrong. And they have to do with the notion of infinity and the notion of completed infinities. And so if you care about you know, the world of ideas, you have to examine the ideas at the peak of the pyramid, and those ideas turn out to be um, embarrassingly bad, some of them. So the, so the reason that it's, a big deal that there's bad ideas in, in math 
is essentially that math is the last refuge of scoundrels that when, when someone is trying to be pinned against the wall for bad ideas in other areas of life, they will attempt to justify any form of logical contradiction by saying even math, the purest of the pure yeah. science that is indisputable proves that logical contradictions can exist. And that's kind of what makes you find math something you want to tackle because you want to take that argument away. That's one, one perspective. There's actually two. So the first perspective is sort of from a pure theoretical, pers- uh, th- theoretical standpoint. If you're trying to build a worldview to understand reality, you have to have an explanation of what math is and how it relates to the world. And uh, if there are such things as logical contradictions that are inescapable in mathematics, that's actually a very, very big deal. So just from the ideas perspective, you actually got to kind of sort out math a little bit, at least get the foundations in order. There's a, uh, there's a, Secondary argument, which is to say that uh, the world of ideas as a, uh, as a social phenomena is very hierarchical. And when you have these, these big shots, these big mathematicians, you can't disagree with the math. The math speaks for itself, you know, right? When the mathematician says X, X is, is likely to be true. That's also a problem from, like the, from a sociological standpoint. There's also a standpoint, which is that in various other domains, there are uh, often abuses of mathematics, appeals to mathematics that are absolutely terrible, that build, that build bad structures of knowledge and also negatively affect our life. Like, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, what does it mean to say there is an exponential graph of infections of COVID? Because yeah. when somebody says, oh, no, you don't understand, we must lock the world down, it's an exponential graph. That's, a, that's an appeal to the weight of mathematics to try to justify some type of outcome or what just happened in Bitcoin Cash. You have the, the brilliant mathematician who did very well, who made a point, uh, uh, Amari Sassé made a point of saying he did very well in math in the, his French school. And when he talks about game theory, he says, hey, listen, uh, Bitcoin ABC is a shelling point. And what that means is, in other words, we're very, very important. And that means you should essentially make sure that you give us money because we are the shelling point. Do you know what a shelling point is? If you don't know what a shelling point is, that means you're kind of stupid. And that means you should really shut up and do what I tell you to do because I'm the mathematician guy and I'm telling you that Bitcoin ABC is a shelling point. So suddenly we have an appeal to mathematical concepts in something like Bitcoin and something like industry and something like COVID. It just comes up and in economics, as you well know, there are all kinds of appeals to, to mathematics that don't actually pour it onto the world. So it's very important to have a clear philosophy of mathematics. So you want to bring, you want to bring math down a notch in a way as well so that people, you know, it's funny, I, I found this any area that I've gone into in any depth and I never have in math, but um, recently I have started to in health before COVID for my own health, uh, particularly like virology and understanding of bloodborne infections, bacteria, you know, I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert, but you go deep enough and you realize we don't know what the fuck we're doing. And (laughs) if, if the common view could just be, there are way more things we don't understand in health than those we do or in math or in astronomy, or in whatever, that alone would be really, really powerful check against some of the abuses. So <clears throat> let me see if I can explain, because you shared a video. This is what prompted me to call you. Yeah. And, and at risk of going on one of my things where I talk for too long, which I definitely have a problem with. You get a lot of criticism for that, Isaac. I think it's all right. It's some fair people criticism. talk more than others. It's okay. Well, look, the reason that I care about it, and I normally don't listen to very much criticism, is because my, in my family, uh, we all are talkers. And I have, I have been the I victim see. of I see. my own relative's <laughs> inability to contain. It's a self-defense family. mechanism. I yes, see. and the older I get, the more I realize I'm going to be less and less aware of p- other people's social cues. And I don't want to be an old guy who like, everyone's like, oh my God. He you know, I sort of have the same thing here, except with nose hairs. So I remember when I was really young, my grandfather had some nose hair sticking out. And I was like, never, never <laughs> shall I. And now every once and I'm like, you know, it's there. I'm just going to let it be. <laughs> you just got to meld it into the mustache beard. Yeah, you know, it's not, it's really not worth it. <laughs> so you, you, this is what got me on it. Because I, I mean, I've heard you talk about math and, and we've chatted a little bit about infinity stuff and whatever, but you posted a really great video. It was like 40 minutes long. And I saw you um, on Twitch. Um, with some people saying, hey, go check this out. And the video was basically um, 
why the concept of real numbers is fake, why real numbers are fake. And he essentially says, and I thought it was a great video, made perfect sense to me, and I, I didn't disagree with anything in it. He says, look, take something like pi, which is a number that you can't define because it has an infinite number of, of you know, decimals. It keeps going. There's the practical use of pi, and he's not arguing against that. It's a useful hack. What pi is, is a hack. It's basically an admission that we don't know exactly how the hell to figure out the area of a circle, but we found a hack that works good enough. And for whatever your application, you can just keep extending the number of decimals to get it accurate enough for that particular application. So for practical mathematics, there's all kinds of hacks like this, and they're yeah. great. In pure mathematics, rather than just saying, we don't know what pi is and we can't actually prove that this is some actual existing number that is used in these arithmetical functions. We just, we just discovered that it works. We can't really tell you why the hell it works and we can't actually use it in a verifiable way theoretically. Instead of just saying that, which would be the honest thing to say, the pure mathematicians just basically define themselves out of the problem by saying, oh no, we can do all these good because it's a, it's a repeating set and then we can multiply that by another you know, infinite set and we can do all these things and they basically just create new symbols that are essentially self-referential and that in order to try to justify. So I get all that and I think that's silly, but why does it really matter that the few people in the world who are doing pure mathematics are arrogant enough or stupid enough to pretend that they can get away from the fact that these infinite numbers can't be multiplied by each other and given and give an answer that makes sense like why does that matter to the rest of the world what 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 is the negative implication that that's going to have so it's several several different things i'm going to say before i answer that question um i'll say pi is you know one of the most important foundational practical concepts in mathematics. So when people are critical of the conceiving of pi, it's usually very subtle and important points, but it does not translate into saying, you know, we can't use pi anymore. That's not what a lot of people are, are, are who are critics would, would argue for. Um, there's, there's a, so I'll, I'll answer your the second part of the question. The reason it's important is many fold. So first of all, because we have a, a sociological hierarchy and generally an intellectual hierarchy in terms of how important we think various disciplines are, um, I, I, it's the same thing uh, as if philosophers were making a huge error in the fundamentals of the way that they approach philosophy. So it's, it's sort of the same phenomenon. Sociologically, that would be a problem because philosophers are actually very important and they should, well, Philosophers should be more important, maybe not academic philosophers, but in terms of like those who are actually contributing to the world of ideas, in my opinion, philosophy is the inescapable foundation. You can't get below philosophy because you're just doing more philosophy. And mathematics, I think, is actually sort of subservient. To, it's definitely subservient to philosophy because you can ask philosophical questions about mathematical constructs, and most mathematicians don't. Um, so there's the sociological uh, component, and there's, the, there's, again, the worldview component. Now, if you have somebody it's it's sort of like um imagine we were talking about theology uh, uh, a few centuries ago and theology is actually an important discipline especially have a, have a try to have a rational conception of god we're not just talking pure faith-based stuff but you're trying to understand the properties of god in like in like a 16th century context if all the theologians are making some elementary error and are incredibly dogmatic and unable to see um the errors and the theories they're constructing that's a big deal like Ideas matter, and and it's especially important for me because I'm very partial to axiomatic deductive reasoning when it can be done carefully. Like humans have this unbelievable ability to identify truth and then use careful logical deduction to figure out other strains of truth based on that one truth. And that is like a sacred method. That is a sacred process. And when that gets screwed up, okay, it's a big. I, I, yeah. I don't disagree with you, but it, but you're still kind of up in the sky. It's like, it's dangerous to have wrong ideas that can have bad implications. Fair. Can you give me a concrete example of how the errors in pure mathematics have made the world worse? Besides, oh, you can't get academic tenure unless you agree with that. 
So I would say that it is uh, definitely the case that in physics, for example, there have been bad ideas that have been perpetuated for decades, for 50 years, um, where sound minds in the domain of physics have wasted away working with shitty concepts that don't actually port onto the world because they don't make logical sense. So I would say the, there is a huge amount of intellectual horsepower and IQ points that are all spinning their wheels or going in the opposite direction because the framework for thinking about math that they've inherited is definitely wrong. And it, it, it's like, um, you know, engineer, there's also a relation between physics and engineering here. If you have, if, if in your, if in the educational system, your engineers all are getting taught bad methods of reasoning or bad ideas about what structures can withstand hurricanes and what structures can't, that concretely affects the world. So I'd say the same thing, like with, with infinity and the amount of um, uh, space that has been wasted and mental cycles that have been spent uh, in the debates with thinking mathematicians and physica, uh, physicists de debating people who are talking about really bad ideas in math and physics is huge. It's a huge amount of, so, of so maybe time. like you feel like yeah. the, the theoretical component, um, say pure mathematics errors there slow the progress of applied mathematics, which slows the progress of computer science and physics and engineering, yes. which slows and the progress of, actual material world, that's one problem. And then there's also the problem you started with, which is that the, the belief culturally that mathematicians are like these gods that know everything leads to a lot of uh, deference to authority and um, academia having an undue influence over the world. And lockdowns. I mean, I, mean I, would, I would personally port a connection between a mistaken understanding of the philosophy of math and global lockdowns. And, and here's, here's an unseen uh, consequence of this. I occasionally get emails from people who say to me uh, 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 the, something along the, these lines. Wow, Steve, I really enjoyed your commentary, your articles on infinite sets or some mathematical thing. They say, I was uh, debating this with my a teacher in high school or in college, and I thought I was so stupid that I said, oh, I'm not cut out for higher math, even though I enjoyed mathematics and I pursued something else. So that's an unseen cost. Maybe the world does not have those excellent minds who could have gone into engineering or some other thing because they thought, oh, I'm stupid because I can't make sense of these concepts that actually turn out not to make sense. Yeah, that's funny. I, I, I'm not saying like I wasn't like in love with math to begin with, but when, when math got to basically the, the irrational numbers or whatever, all this, you know, bullshit of, you know, co you know cosine of whatever. Multi I just remember being like, this just seems stupid to me. I'm not interested in I don't want to sit here and debate with people about all these imaginary things. Yeah. Like, I don't get why that's interesting to them. So I just kind of decided, I decided I just didn't understand it well enough. And right. maybe that's true. I'm not claiming I have a good understanding of math. But the more that I've learned about other disciplines, the more I realize, like, it's often the case when you get to a point where you think, huh, I must, I must not just be smart enough to get it. It's yep. because you've hit a point where the obfuscation level has gotten really Yes, and, and what you have is a fracturing. You have a fracturing of students who go, oh, yeah, I understand these concepts. These check out. I'm a smart guy who's learning the smart thing. And those are actually the people who are so dumb that they're not asking the questions that they know they should be asking. Or, good heavens, they're too stupid. They don't even know they should be asking the questions. And, and so breakthroughs, you have to breakthroughs in disciplines often come from somebody in a different discipline that right. comes in sort of orthogonal that's a thing you br you bring in some some external uh mind who doesn't have the same framework as everybody else who's trying to approach a problem and sure enough they can think of the problem in a different way so, and this is and i like norma wildberger is one of my heroes i think he's doing incredibly important work it's funny so i started i started walking I down understood this, his entire video it was super simple uh yes uh, so the, the funny thing is right those if you go online wildberger god bless the man okay a couple of stories. First of all, I started walking down this road of math heresy several years ago now. And at the time, I didn't know of Norma Weilberger. And I had, I was, I'm not interested in, in mathematics in terms of like applied math, like what the actual formulas, I don't give a shit. I care about the philosophy of mathematics, but I don't really care about the mathematics itself. But I thought, all right, well, I'm definitely onto something with the fact that there, that the idea of a completed infinity is nonsense. You do not, you cannot get an output out of an infinitary process. 
You don't reach to the end of something that has no end and withdraw some meaningful content. That's a logical contradiction. So <laughs> for some period of time, <laughs> I was like, well, shit, maybe I need to be doing some math. So I developed these very laughably elementary intuitions about Okay, like what is it exactly an irrational number? What's the square root of two? How to, it was really, really hard. It was fun. It was a good exercise, but I was sort of, I thought I was the only person in the world doing this. Well, I, I had created some video on it, and one of, one of my listeners said, Hey, you should check out this Norman Wildberg guy. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this guy, I was working, you know, I, in terms of the scale, I, like, I had got to like square one or two, and he's at like square 10,000 for developing the new mathematical theory on well, not exactly the same foundations, but far superior foundations. We overlap probably like 95% when he's talking about things. I'm like, okay, yeah, this actually makes logical sense. It's funny because I interviewed him on my show and he hates philosophy, he thinks. He's like, oh, we, he, he actually... For some good reason, this video was a philosophy video. I know he doesn't think of it that way though, because because the actual relationship of academic philosophy to math has been a shitty one. Part of the people, the people that established a lot of these terrible ideas in the turn of the 20th century, were also philosophers. People like Bertrand Russell, people yep. like Georg Cantor, theologian slash philosopher slash slash mathematician. So in his mind, he's thinking the last thing we need is in, is philosophy. <laughs> And then I talk to him, and I'm like, oh, you can think of it that way, but you are doing philosophy. Yeah, like the, the whole, your whole way of approach is a, a different philosophical woman. You don't, you're not a Platonist. You don't think there are, there are, there are numbers out there with, that are unknown quantities that we can never really concretely access, but we only approximate. And you're saying, no, 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 the numbers are the things that are constructed by a particular a uh, particular method. What your computer generates is actually you're creating a number rather than it existing out there in the ether prior to, to its construction. He just didn't think of it in that way. Anyway, that was a, that was, yeah, that was multiple stories. What, how, how did this, you asked me a question and then I went on the story part. I'm trying to remember the, where the, we were talking about the real world. Uh, now I know that when I meet a business owner whose company went under because of lockdowns, I will tell them the real reason it went under is because Mad people think is because people think infinite sets exist. Um, there is a there is a connection there. Yeah, yeah I, I were, guess. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It, it, it was something along the lines of um, Wildberger. You were talking about the Wildberger video, and yeah. throughout his work, he is trying to be honest. He's trying to say, okay, actually, the the theory of real numbers doesn't check out. If you're just being intellectually honest, mm -hmm. then you, you can't assume that your conclusions are true. So like there's different ways of trying to define real numbers and it has changed over time. And our current attempts at defining it sound nice and can please undergrad students and grad students, but they're not actually, they don't check out. They're not logically rigorous. There's a, there's a bunch of mush here and he just acknowledges it. And I swear he is, he has a tiny, he has a tiny glimmer of hope in a, in a just total garbage heap uh, of, uh, of supposed thinkers. These are the people with the highest IQs in the world. And I'm telling you, of all the different disciplines that I have investigated and all the different professionals that I have spoken with who are professors and supposed intellectuals, mathematicians are the most dogmatic of all of them, more so than the religious. I have not met a religious person as dogmatic as some of these mathematicians who have literally never conceived of a single alternative way of thinking about mathematics than that which they were taught in high school. I would not have believed that, Steve, because it sounds so absurd on its face, given the number of dogmatists I've met in other areas, until I started seeing you dive into this territory, and I started seeing what would happen to your Facebook comments, your YouTube <laughs> yes. comments. Your, I mean, and even people that I knew that I didn't even know were like really into math, like friends of mine or colleagues, I would see them just become the worst versions of themselves. <laughs> I could imagine just ripping on you and hate for things that I was like, how yes. can you get emotional over this? Like I can yes. see getting emotional over politics or religion or even sports for God's sake. But like what <laughs> circles. Okay. Here's what it is. This is such a fascinating phenomenon. Here's what it is. Math is the domain that in our intellectual religion and in, in the, in the West, well, I think oh, it's actually a global thing. We think that this is the special place for smart people. Would you do something correct in mathematics and you, you get approval from mathematicians and you mathematically prove something? That is supposed to be outside of 
criticism from non-mathematicians or who was or conceived non-mathematicians. You know, that is supposed to be like, you have reached a level of true, pure intellect and brilliance when you're talking math. Yeah, and, and people they think, say, oh, uh, someone's really smart. Being really good at math is like usually the thing that matters the most when that word is used. You know what I yes. mean? And, and it matters most to those who are mathematically skilled because psychologically they are approaching the world with this unflappable belief of them being the smart ones. They, they think, and they think that means, well, that generally, as it applies to most things, most things in the world, I am part of the intelligent group and, and, the, and I have special knowledge that cannot be wrong. I am presented with the sacred knowledge of mathematics in various um, uh, domains. And ha they have never encountered any, any criticism or challenge of their mathematical ideas. So when they do, their heads explode. They go, you know, it's like it is a personal, sci deep psychological attack on their self-conception. If it's the case that they're wrong about the things that they, they reserved as sacred truths that all the smart people share, and those are wrong and maybe even wrong for elementary reasons, that is just a, that in, people make inferences to their own intelligence and they go oh gosh i must not be very smart or they do the converse of this which is also funny they go steve if you were right you would have to be a genius that's the only way you are not a genius therefore you are not right <laughs> and i'm like first of all i don't accept that framework because if if you're saying in order for me to be right that I, i'm a genius that makes me very uncomfortable because my claim is actually much more damning than that i'm saying that it does not take a genius to see that what I'm saying is true. And I mean that literally. I mean, if you have a, an honest 15 year old who, who is listening to what I'm saying, they're trying to honestly compare it to what their, their calculus professor is saying. They're gonna go, you know, actually Steve makes a good point. I sort of see what he's saying. So I'm, no, saying you, it, you, I'm not saying it takes a genius. I'm saying it takes somebody that's honest. And I think most disciplines get to this level, certainly philosophy or the philosophy of any discipline. How do you know this? you get to a point where you can only go further um, if you ignore your common sense, where it's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, yeah. well, it does if you just throw common sense out the window, and then you yeah. can go further, right? Like, yes, yeah, and, and when you do that, here's what the intellectual class does. They play these games where they go, okay, well, we're just assuming that all of these fundamental errors are sorted out, and they spend the rest of their careers and intellectual energies building on top of those dubious assumptions that they never took enough time to challenge. Yeah. And then the whole game that they're playing is based on bad assumptions. So the papers that they write, the sophisticated conversations they have around the water cooler, it's all based on these assumptions that they never took the time to challenge. It is identical to what happens with religion. I remember Common, seeing that in economics yeah. and having the realization that like almost every sort of sub-discipline of economics is utterly, like the entirety of welfare economics, right? The minute you accept that interpersonal utility calculations are impossible, the entire discipline in every paper ever written becomes utterly useless and pointless. But there are just like tons of people doing it all the time. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. So, okay. Here's a, I'm, I'm thinking of a way to, because I keep coming back to this accepting and acknowledging that there are things that I don't want to say unknowable, but at least unknown. So you don't have to be a genius to understand that this stuff is incorrect. Now, maybe you have to be a genius to come up with a correct theory. Like Wildberger. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That can rebuild these things on new foundations, but there's sort of two, like my question is, do we even necessarily need that? Right? Cause there's kind of two things that happen when you, when you run into a, this, this spot where you say there's, there's the practical and applied person who says, I have no clue what the hell pi is or if it's real. I just know that it actually works when I'm trying to get the area of a circle. So I use it and it's a mystery. That's almost like the faith-based approach. Look, I don't know why the hell this works, but it does. And I, it's because it works because God gave us miraculous golden, you know, numbers that we can use and, and whatever, right? Whatever it is, you just sort of have faith because it's worked in the past and you use it. And you just sort of say, I don't need to know. Like some things are unknowable. That, and then the other is, I want to know what it is. I'm going to keep pursuing it. That's the person that tends to either go crazy, lose their mind, like literally, and I've, and I've heard, I don't know if this is true, that in higher mathematics is like the highest rate of insanity of any discipline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a thing. It's a thing. Yeah, it's like a real, I think Ted Chang has like a short story I read about, which is great. Um, 
they either go crazy or they have to either say, I've studied it my whole life and I still can't give you the answer. Or they just have to at some point throw in the towel and pretend they have the answer. And I think that's the most dangerous of all. Pretending to know something that we don't know is what you're railing against. My question is, is it better to just not try to find the answer and just use the thing that works practically rather well, than so, trying to find the answer? So let a thousand flowers bloom. Like uh, some people are going to be interested in the application. Some people are going to be interested in the theory. I tend to be more on the theoretical end. And so that's what I'm, that's what I'm railing against. Um, you said something I wanted to, something really good I wanted to comment on. Oh, the in, insanity thing. So I actually have some theories on, on what's going on here. So I think part of the reason that um, mathematicians go crazier or are crazier than uh, other disciplines is, is uh, partly because of autism. Um, and uh, autism, I think, has a connection with brain inflammation, as nervous system inflammation, and it also sort of gives people superpowers. Um, uh, autism can, or Asperger's, whatever you want to call it, the people who are your stereotypical computer scientists, mathematicians, they have the ability to hyper, 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 hyper focus on one specific thing, deal with one variable at a time, but like take it to its, you know, super magnified level. And that is awesome for math. Um, that's not awesome for a lot of other things. But I think what happens is because people have this mindset, and uh, uh, I, I used to have more of it than I do now. I'm sort of working out of it. I was never like super autistic, but I mean, that's like definitely a, a case of it. And that's okay. Um, what happens is they, because they're not good at philosophy, they build these long streams of deduction. And the idea that the, you know, and every single step along the way, they're certain. This, I know this, I know this, and I know that I know this. So then when you start evaluating the foundations, you go, oh my gosh, every single thing that I thought I knew is possibly wrong. And get this, the poor people. They, they even go, because they're not good philosophers and they're not good critical thinkers, they go, oh my gosh, mathematics might internally contain contradictions. That this is a thing. This is a thing that was discussed in the first part of the 20th century, especially. Is mathematics complete? Is it provably complete? Are there nested contradictions in it? And some people are seriously entertaining the idea that there are inescapable contradictions in structures of mathematics. So for them, that's the only way they know how to think is sort of in that mathematical, logical, deductive sense. And they go, I cannot know anything. It is impossible for me to know anything. There are contradictions. Everything I've built, everything on top of just gets, just kind of collapses. And it's no surprise that insanity is the result. The, the famous example, one of the famous examples is Georg Cantor, the guy who I think you've probably heard me talk about before. This is the guy who did develop a theory of infinite sets around the turn of the 20th century. I, I can't um, tell you, I didn't know anything about him until you started talking about math because every friend I told about you and was like, oh, check out this guy's book on Bitcoin or this uh, interview about Ross Albrecht. They would come back and be like, oh, I saw that guy. He's crazy because he hasn't read Cantor. Or no, wait, not Cantor. Maybe it's the Girdle? other guy. Is Cantor the one that you hate? Uh, Cantor is one of the ones that I hate. Okay, yeah. I think it was Cantor. The one, I, all these people kept being like, oh, well, Cantor so, un, explained all that. Steve just doesn't understand. I mean, it, it could be that. Girdle. I don't know. Those are the two. It was, maybe it was Girdle. I think it was yeah, Girdle. Yeah. I think yeah, it was yeah. actually Girdle. Well, that's, anyway. that's a separate thing. Yeah, they don't know what they're talking about. But uh, with Cantor, so he's the guy that came up with the theory of the infinite set. That, he called it the transfinite set. And I kid you not, he, he, the reason he developed this theory is because he thought God talked to him and told him the, it was the glory of God was the transfinite and the infinite personally kind of talked to him and told him this theory. And I'm not saying that God can't speak to people. I'm just saying it should that be a cool red flag. Me. Yeah. Like it should be a red flag though. If one is to be very hierarchical and say, okay, this is the, this is a critical breakthrough in the story of the philosophy and mathematics, the history of mathematics, the foundations of mathematics, the guy that was first talking about infinite sets did say that God spoke to him and it was the glory of the transfinite. Uh, that was telling him his, his theories. And he did end up in an asylum and kind of went crazy. And it's also not a surprise to me because if you're trying, if you, if you have this, this type of mindset and you're meditating on the concept of a completed infinity and you're absolutely convinced there's such a thing as a completed infinity, you're going to go crazy because there is a logical contradiction, the idea that uh, there is a completed infinity. And for me, like I have a specific definition for insanity. Right, so, so there's a lot, a lot of parts, when, when people are talking about insanity, they're talking about some social thing, like you believe something that lots of other people don't believe. I don't care about that. 
I think there is such a thing as insanity, which is something like believing in the existence of logical contradictions or thinking a logical contradiction is true. It's like the only constraints I'm putting on insanity. I mean, it'll break your brain. It'll Yeah. You know. If you're a mystic, okay. Like you say, all is one. I am part of God. I've seen the whole thing. Great. It's possible. But if you say there's a logical contradiction, that's the only barrier where I'm saying, I'm sorry, you're nuts. So it's not, again, it's not a surprise. If you meditate on, if you deeply believe, if you have religious conviction that there are completed infinities and you think about it long enough, you might go a little bit crazy. And that's where I almost think like the, you know, the, the, the sort of religious take, for lack of a better word, or the woo-woo take of like, you encounter something like that that you can't explain and you say, wow there are mysteries in the world and I'm in awe of the mysteries and I'm going to just ponder them and be in awe of them and just let yeah. them be and not make me uncomfortable. That can get silly and woo woo as well, but there's something about that that's maybe safer, maybe preferable in some instances than yeah. I must figure this out until it makes me go crazy. You well, know? and also, I don't think there needs to be a tension here. So I'm totally open to spiritual experience. I've had a spiritual spiritual experience, totally changed my life. Like, yep, that is a that a part of the a part God, of human God existence. God told you that what he told Cantor was actually wrong. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> craziness imminent. No, uh, God told me that uh, uh, as much as I love my wife Julia, that's how much He loves me. The most powerful realization that belief that I could have. Now. I don't think, I don't have to segment that in my brain and be like, I shan't ever think about this. I shan't make sense of it. I, if there's a logical contradiction, so be it. It's like, no, it's just, it's a part of my experiences. I'm trying to explain in the most rational way possible. And I think there's also something here, like you can be, you can be a tolerant theoretician. So, so the, if you are a strict theoretician, then you say Cantor was an idiot and his existence was uh, damaging to the world of ideas. I'm a little bit favorable to that, but if you, <laughs> want to be, if you want to be tolerant, you could say, look, the concept of the completed infinity has been very useful in mathematics. We can say as a, as a good theoretical point, actually, we have to clean up this idea. There, we can extract value from the concept of the completed infinity without actually committing logical errors. That's great as well. It's just when people... People are absolutely committed. They're devoted. They are religious devotees of the idea that in a literal sense, there are actualized, completed infinities in the world and the concept checks out. And that's what I have the problem with, a big problem with. I want to say one other thing. I actually wrote this because I didn't want to forget it. I've been watching more football this season. And on two, I know, right? I used to be really into the NFL and I kind of gave it up, but now um, I'm enjoying it a little bit more. There's a couple of occasions which have made me quite angry which uh, I think it was like uh, two, two point conversions. And uh, one of them was a two point conversion and one was a, a f going on it for four, on fourth down instead of like kicking a field goal. And on uh, both occasions, you know, the per they, when they went for it for two, they failed. And when they tried to convert the fourth down, they failed. And I was like, you dummies, obviously you did the wrong thing here. And some of the commentators said, well, you know, you know, Brett, um, they have a, the statisticians over there and the math checks out. You have to check the math says in this circumstance, you're supposed to kick the field goal. And I'm going, you absolute idiots. Math does not work that way. And the reason math doesn't work that way is because there are too many variables for you to plug into your little formula. You, if you're going to make good decisions in the football field, you have to say, okay, what's the momentum like? Is it raining? Do I have any relevant injuries? There's even a political dimension. If I, if I don't go for it here, um, and I defer to the statistician, but other people don't like the statistician, then they don't like them. So even if we make it, is it long-term a bad decision for the quality of my team be for political reasons? Are you gonna, you're telling me that your statisticians have the formula for the probabilities? Give me a break. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I've always been interested in that in sports, and there's like some high school coach that always goes for it on fourth down, always goes for two, and always kicks an onside kick. And his team is like really good. And when you look at it statistically, the number of times it's successful and the payoff for success ends up averaging out to where like that is a rational position to take. And so people will argue from that. And I'm like, you got to think not all two point conversions are equal. Not all onside kick recoveries are equal. If you're a head coach, and you're in a conference championship game about to go to the Super Bowl, and you're up by seven, and your defense is playing great, and you do your onside kick, and the other team gets it with a short field and goes down and scores, 
you're going to get fired. And yeah. rightly so. No, right? no, no. You could make it to the NFL if, if what I'm uh, listening to is true. Because even the commentators were like, well, you know, you can't argue with the math. And so I'm this like, is interesting. This is interesting. This is where I think realizing, trying to be more prag- pragmatist. And, I, and I've become this way more and more over my life with ideas, seeing them, not that there aren't, you know, absolute truths, nothing like that, but seeing them more as a toolkit that's useful in certain circumstances. So this all started with baseball. It started with Billy Bean at the Oakland A's and the book Moneyball, the movie Moneyball is all about this. And he, with a lot of success, saw how the old school guys, the old school scouts were kind of like, hey, he's a, he's a five tool player and I've got gut feel and I'm gonna bring him on. And he saw how he kind of used all the statistical analysis to see how certain things were actually more important than other things. Now, there's criticisms of, of his method, and I think it can go too far in baseball for sure, but he's had a lot of success. I think what's interesting to me is that the statistical approach is way more relevant in baseball than any other sport. They play 162 games. They have like three, four at-bats every game. Every at-bat is like six, seven pitches. And so when you start to look at the sheer quantity, individual games don't matter that much um, in terms of your total, you know, ability to make the playoffs and whatever. And like, it's way more useful in baseball. You move to basketball and it's less useful than in baseball, but way more than football. They play 82 games. They have, you know, they, they shoot, the, they have 50, 100 possessions a game. And so you look at the difference between a two-pointer and a three-pointer statistical analysis, it's like it's taken the three-pointer a long time because of cultural factors to get to its logical end, which is that you should be shooting three-pointers way, 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 way more than the originally was happening when the three-point line was introduced. You should be shooting more three-pointers, you know, than anything other than layups, right? Those things make sense. You move it to football, it applies even less. They play 16 games. There's hardly, there's like 40 snaps on offense the players, the same player, you know, players play maybe 20, 10 to 20 plays in an entire game oftentimes. The injuries, the, the home field away, the emotional ups and downs, those things are all, all those other factors are elevated even more and the statistical component is even less relevant. So it's just yeah. interesting to see it applied universally when like there's something valuable to it, right? Just like when you play poker, You can have an advantage if you have a good understanding of statistics by realizing something that may feel wrong in your gut is actually like probabilistically a good move to make. But you also need to understand that sometimes that's not what you want to do, right? Like not all situations are equal. And if you can read the emotion, if the guy across from you is drunk and you know he's gonna go all in no matter what, because you've seen him drunk before, then you going, you know, trying to bluff is not a good thing, even though the statistics would tell you to. Exactly. But, and even then, in each one of those case, cases that you're bringing up in the different sports, the more you zoom in, the more you realize, actually, it's not the math itself that implies anything. Should you be shooting more three-pointers? Well, it depends. Who do you have on your team? If your players, if, if they happen to have spent their lives not practicing the three-pointer, then in that time and circumstance, they should be shooting the three-pointers. If if you're coming from, if somebody's got a background and like it turns out their personal story is the the way that they set up their hoop, there was a bunch of like rocks in the middle area they didn't want to step on, so they just practiced over and over shooting the three-pointers. They could be like, okay, I don't really care what the statistics say in this particular, this individual circumstance, the variables are such that it makes more sense to shoot the three-pointer. And that's the case in every domain. Every domain outside of uh, mathematics and maybe a little bit in physics and definitely a bit in engineering, when you're trying to play the pure math game, you're going to fail because you're simply not taking enough variables into account. And, and, it, and this is, it, it really did burn me when I'm watching the football because I'm like, the only reason I'm hearing these commentators talking about this bad decision as if it was a good decision is the social aspect. 
and they were laughing about that. Like, oh, I don't understand the numbers. I wouldn't have done that. But I mean, if the math says to do it, they, yeah, like, they'll say stuff like, well, they got, they got a real smart guy up in the booth there. And they'll call down and tell them whether or not the math tells them to do this. Exactly. And, and it's like it. So for, for me, I'm going at this is the same, I, the same intellectual cancer and the philosophy of mathematics can be seen when you're talking about interpretations of quantum mechanics and you're talking about it on the freaking football field. Yeah. We should let a computer uh, coach an NFL team. Yeah, yeah. And see if Software. it can do that as well as it can play chess or, uh, or Go. <laughs> or whatever. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, so I just have to say something about this. Okay, so this is so. This is also infuriating. So in chess, this is one of the things I, I love. A chess player I have been for many years. I love it. I'm actually doing a chess tournament this weekend, which I'm excited about. I haven't been able to do that in a while because of COVID, but. Um, so Alpha Zero is this program that Google came up with, and um, they have a different approach to uh, uh, playing chess than other pre-existing computer programs. And it's actually the way they do it is brilliant, and there's all kinds of lessons that can be learned about the learning process because Alpha Zero doesn't have the biases of humans. It doesn't have the inputs of grandmasters and established theory. So like when Alpha Zero just came on the market, people were like, it played this crazy, ridiculous move that's definitely wrong. And then it ends up winning because, because it doesn't have those biases. It's really fascinating. But anyway, people think that, that Alpha Zero is, uh, and, uh, and its success in uh, chess and Go is a reflection of the inevitability of computers making all of our decisions for us in the world. And it's like, guys, you have to understand the chessboard is an eight by eight grid of black and white squares with a finite number of pieces on it, all of which have a finite number of moves. And you can literally, it's the perfect information game. This is a raw, could be a raw calculation game. The world, any part of the actual world that is not a constructed game by humans is a billion times more complex than that. Well, and, and humans took what, like, a thousand years to teach a machine to be able to play that eight <laughs> yeah, by eight. Yeah. It's an eight <laughs> by eight grid. It's like, it, and, and, and it, it's, there's no creativity. There's no, there's no outside of the box creativity on the chessboard. Like there's all kinds of creativity within, because it's so complex for humans, you can have creative play, but it's not like you're going to see the bishop moving sideways. Like that type of thing. There's no, there's not really empirical wonder that can be found on the chessboard if but, you play with my kids there is <laughs> well true uh, you know all of a sudden you know the like pieces a, can a be thrown and everything. Car will run over my king you know <laughs> well exactly Very but like the, the, there's no there's no there's no shock of discovery um in a radical sense on the chessboard but there is in the most in every little piece of of the world that we live in there is material shock and awe that that, that a computer is not suited does this i'm not even sure if it has the capacity to learn about it's an open question in my mind but yes anyway you well, got me going Steve, yeah no i feel like we could go for for a long time we're, we're gonna wrap it up on for this time we'll have to do another discussion but um now i have a new life goal which is to watch football with you because i feel yeah. like you would be equally as angry as me but about totally different things so it'd be great <laughs> we would compliment you know each yeah other's well uh, rumor is you're a detroit lions fan so oh. I don't know. It makes me a little uncomfortable. I don't know if no, I want to be with losers. The but. nice thing about Lions fans is that we know that we're losers. So we're, we're okay. very easy to be around. We're self depth We hate ourselves. We don't know why we're Lions Fair fans. Fair enough. Fair aren't enough. You, you know from, where you stand in the hierarchy. Aren't you from like upstate New York? Yeah, anyway. Uh, Are you a Buffalo I, fan? Uh, well, I, I, I grew up in the proximity of Buffalo and Buffalo fans. So technically, hey, this year though, Buffalo's doing well. Yeah. Last year. I mean, it did take 20 years to get there, but or 30 well, years. They, they I used know. to go to the Super Bowl and lose all the time, which was yeah, um, four times in a row. I hear yeah, and like you yeah. know, people say how hard that must be as a Lions fan. I'm like, that sounds like heaven to me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to sniff greatness. I don't um, have any. I can't say I have any any teams that I'm like a super. We've been moving so much yeah. that I just can't invest and say I'm a Cardinals fan because I'm in Arizona. You know, I guess I'm rooting for the Bills. You know, just given the history, they've sucked for so long. It's a good yeah. story. Well, you know, if you know Bills fans, then I fully expect if they win uh, this week for you to get hammered and dive off the roof of an RV onto a folding table. That's how I like to party, for sure. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> hey, thanks, Steve. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Good talking with you.